And we're underway. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Bull Charts User Group webinar for all of our Bull Charts users. We're getting underway. Tonight, we've got a presenter, one of our Melbourne users, Des Bleakley, who will be showing his screen, presenting some PowerPoint slides and, and showing some Bull Charts charts. An important disclaimer, please remember any information presented or discussed tonight is only opinion, not advice, and shouldn't be acted upon. Here is the agenda that I prepared for last week's Melbourne meeting and for tonight's webinar. And the major item on the agenda is Des talking, oh, I've spelled it wrong, don't tell anyone. Des talking about Bullscript tonight along the lines of introduction to Bullscript. There's also an opportunity to talk about the ASX share trading game if you're participating. We always try to include this segment, Bull Charts Tips, exploring key features or asking how do I do this, how do I do that? And we might be able to include some discussion about stocks and sectors we are watching. In last week's Melbourne meeting, 17th of October, a week ago, there were only five people present and two who couldn't be there. We had um, Des's dis presentation that he's going to do tonight. So last week was a practice for him. I have not put any notes in here. Often when there's a presentation, I do put some summary notes in the minutes. Um, last week, it was a bit hard to summarize things without actually quoting some of the script. And you'll understand that when Des goes through that tonight. And there's a short list of stocks that we were watching that are going ex-div, ex-dividend in the coming weeks. And that was about all we did. But even so, that session ran for uh, over two hours, believe it or not. So without further ado, what I'll do is hand control over to Des. Ask Des to get ready there. Make Des the presenter, yes. And while Des is getting things organized and pushing the right buttons, Des has been an active member in our user group now for a few years. He's done a few presentations and you might have seen some of them over the last couple of years. And, and most of those that he's done are in the YouTube Bull Charts collection. You might have seen some of them there. If you haven't seen our Bull, our bull Charts YouTube collection, uh, please do have a look at some stage. Des, are you right to go? Yep. All right. Um, Des, welcome to tonight's webinar. It's something you've done before, so I'm sure you don't have any nerves. Uh, and we're amongst, all, uh, amongst friends. Uh, but Des, welcome. It's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So can you see my screen, which is a very uh, Commonwealth Bank uh, build chart screen? Yes, I can. Very good. Okay, so we're looking at the right things. Yep. Um, I'll just uh, call up my presentation. We'll start from that. And during the presentation, I will be cutting back and forward between the uh, build chart screen and, and the presentation. So that hopefully will be straightforward. Uh, Robert did say that last week, this presentation went on for quite some time. And that was good from my point of view because there was a fair bit of interaction. And from my viewpoint again, I was particularly rewarded in that in a couple of people in the room, we could see a little light bulb moment moment when they sort of said, ah, so that's how it works. Now I get it. And hopefully uh, for some of us tonight, that may also happen. I am very aware though that uh, this webinar group is probably a little bit more, um, sophisticated when it comes to bull charts. So apologies if anybody thinks I'm talking down to them. That is not my intention at all. But uh, Robert said he did want to record this. So he's got a, um, if you like, a, a pretty full on bull charts for bull script for dummies. Uh, and uh, it is not meant to talk to you. Questions as you go. Uh, I'm happy to listen to any feedback. Let's get into it. So like all good presentations, it needs to have a title. And uh, I don't know where I'd be without my Ryobi toolkit. Uh, rechargeable, of course, environmental friendly. 
I love Ryobi, and I thought it was a suitable title for this uh, presentation tonight. So it stands for Roll Your Own Bull Charts Indicator. Took us a long time to get there. Uh, just quickly look at the agenda. Uh, I wanted to make sure that this presentation started at the very, very beginning because when people first come into the bull charts environment, it's quite intimidating for them. And we'll all remember back then, how do we do this? Even the most simple thing we found very difficult. And sometimes we were even too embarrassed to ask, and that's a terrible position to be in. So the agenda is starting first principles, let's uh, move into bull charts, bull script. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll put forward some basic bull charts thoughts just to describe the environment in which bull charts and indicators reside. And last week, this was the part that pe people, I think, got most from. This is where the penny dropped for a couple of people. And they said, OK, now I know why bull charts does this when I'm running an indicator, because that's what's happening behind the scenes. And I'd never thought of it like that. Then going into the, the further into the presentation, I want to work with you to develop a, a bull charts indicator that's non-trivial and useful, but not that is over the top bells and whistles. I have literally hundreds of indicators. Some of them, many of them would be hundreds of lines long. Uh, an alternative approach that some people might take is say, here's a big complex indicator. Let's look into it and see what it does. I am purpose in starting from the other side Let's build the most simple indicator first, build it up into something that's, as I say, non-trivial and is useful. Step by step, uh, all the code, all the charts are there. I have gone sort of overkill in terms of uh, the, the preparation. So I'll show you what I want to do. I'll show how I've done it. I'll show the code on the screen that did it. And then I'll show that blown up so that we can easily read it. For most of it tonight, this could be easier because we're all on screens. Uh, last week, this was being projected onto a wall. So that that second phase of looking at it in, in just the code was important to the people in the room. At the end of this, uh, we will have developed an indicator which displays a golden cross. Golden cross is just two moving averages that cross over. Some people swear by different values for the, the two moving averages. Some people love 50 on 200 for long-term trend setting. Some people swear by 9 on 21 or 8 on 20. Not worried about what those numbers are. I want to show you how you can develop it at the Golden Cross indicator or indicators and how we can uh, build that into something which is actually useful to you. And then dot, 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 leave it open-ended. Now that you've got to this stage, you should be able to go further and develop uh, your own indicators. So. When you, you log on to bull charts and open up a chart, just a any any stock with no, no indicators on it, um, it's worthwhile to think of what's behind that screen. And the key thing there is, I say in the top line, think of what's behind the screen. There's just a big spreadsheet. And big, it's enormously big, but that doesn't matter. The screen at any one moment in time is it's looking upon a small subset of the bull charts environment. And on that bull charts environment, it collects its data as a big spreadsheet. Each column in the spreadsheet is an individual date. If you're looking at a daily chart, each column is a day. If you're looking at a weekly chart, each column is a week, monthly, each column is a month, etc. Bull chart looks after that. And every time you you click on the chart from a daily chart to a weekly chart, whatever bull charts behind the scenes organizes these rows accordingly. So that's what you'll see. So vertical columns are one per date. Horizontal rows represent individual variables, individual numbers, individual components that you want to look at, you want to have access to from within the, the, uh, the chart and from within the indicator you're going to put on the chart. Uh, by happen chance and by good design, bull charts itself populates the first number of rows uh, with data that it pulls from the, the database and it pre-populates this so you've got something to start with. Uh, I've given eight rows here. There's actually many more than that. But for the, the sake of discussion, to keep things simple, think of it that the first eight rows 
within the this big spreadsheet have these values in it. Uh, top row along the top is the stock code. So I'll be using CBA in this example just to, to, to pick a stock. Uh, there's CBA up there, there's NAB, there's ANZ, there's XYZ, PQR. All of the stocks that you want to play with are their names will be along the top row. And there'll be more than one uh, for every stock because the next line is the date of this particular vertical bar, this particular column. So Combank will have uh, an entry for the first of the first 2020. Second of the first 2020, third of the first 2020, and so on. And then when you get to the NAB, it'll have first of the first 20 seconds, all that. So every stock within the within the the bull charts environment will have a bar for every day that it has data, and that bar is is identified as a Combank bar or a NAB bar, whatever. Uh, another thing it puts in there is there's a one of the next row uh, you can think of as being the bar number. So the very first bar in the data set, and that does not mean the first bar that's displayed on the chart. It's the very first bar in the total data set within the database. First bar is bar number one, last bar is bar number 327 or 582, whatever it is. First bar is number one. Uh, just bear in mind that not all stocks start at the same, same point in time. So what is the first bar number for Combank may not necessarily be the first bar number for NAB because the data sets may be of different lengths. There may be more information on Combank because it's an older stock than um, on CSL, which, which was probably released later. Then the next column or next, sorry, next row, the sort of stuff that we want to play with, open, high, low, close volume. Those are some of the fundamental values we want to play with and they are pre-populated in there by bull charts. Once we've got our minds around how that has set up, we then should think about how we want to calculate variables and values that are pertinent to the analysis that we want to do. And that's what gets defined below this top stuff. You as the, the writer of the indicator can define any row you like, give it a name, give it a formula, define what it is, and you can create that variable as a row within this big spreadsheet. Important, you can only use data that's above you in the spreadsheet. So this is just exactly like an Excel spreadsheet. Until you've defined something up above, you don't have the ability to use it further down. And the other thing to bear in mind, it also means that within the spreadsheet, within the bull charts environment, you can't use a variable to refer to itself, except in some very specific uh, uh, environments. So there's a couple of very special ways you can do that, but generally think about if I want to write about uh, a variable at this level, I must have all of the components to create it from the levels above. Once you've done that, you've created all your variables, you can display these onto the chart, and that's what creates a bull charts indicator. What I've got here now is, is a, just a schematic of what that big spreadsheet sort of looks like. So you can see there at the top, we've got the, uh, the, the first row is the stock name. I've got Combank in there and then arguably lots of other stocks. And then NAB might be the next one or whatever. Obviously there's NAB isn't gonna follow CPA within the database, but you get the idea. All the stocks are lined up there. And for every stock name, there's a vertical column for each of the dates. And again, I've been simple here. I've said combine here, the first of the first 22, the second of the first 22, the third of the first, da 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 da, up to the 24th of the 10th, 23, which is today, which is the last bar of data there would be within that, that database. Next line is the bar number, starting at one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And then values for the open, high, low, close for each of those days, the volume. And I put there, there's lots more other stuff that Build Charts defines. When you look into the manual, you'll see what those are. They're available to you. But for the simple purposes that we want to, uh, to handle today, we're going to just um, take open a high, low, close volume, bar number, the date. Uh, and we'll think of those as being God-given, coming down from on high. And now we then use that data 
to define our own variables using only stuff from above. So I've defined a variable A. I've said it's 27. I've defined variable B. It's 16. I've defined variable C. It's A plus B, which is, that's the formula is, is 43 and so on. And you can then go on to define much other things like MA5, uh, the moving average five is defined as a formula, the moving average of the close five and S for simple. As you go into the, the indicator, you start to define more and more and more complex variables that are of use to you within your indicator. So that's the background that is hidden within bull charts when you come to write a, an indicator. Des, before what I've done here, Des, yep. sorry, before you go on, there's a question in the chat box. Sure. You were just showing us basically a spreadsheet table. The question is, is there one of those for each time period, one for daily, one for weekly, one for monthly, et cetera, or, or how does bull charts cope with those, those different time periods, time frames? Uh, quite frankly, I have no idea how that's implemented internally. Um, I, uh, the bull charts database, uh, obviously has all of this information. Uh, it will load down data into the database, I suspect, in the most, um, the smallest discrete form it can. So for instance, if you were loading minute data, all of the minutes would be in here. And then bull charts, well, I suspect it will aggregate on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Uh, but when you flick the chart from monthly to weekly, bull charts behind the scenes will throw away, if you go to weekly, it will effectively throw away the daily information and just hang on to the weekly information. The precise internals of that, I, could, I couldn't tell you. Okay, I think maybe we can, I can take that on board and find out and yep. respond later. All right, thanks, Thank you, thanks Des. Here's, uh, I'm using CBA as, as the example stock. Um, and here is pretty much as the simplest you can do within bull charts. Uh, I've got a, open high, low, close bar, I put it in black, there's no color, so that's a, a pretty basic uh, chart. And I've drawn a line on this chart at 100. A horizontal line, 100. It doesn't co come much simpler than that. Uh, and we're gonna use this and build up. And apologies to those who might think this is uh, overly simple. That is the code on the, the right-hand side there is the code that creates that chart. Uh, for those that you are familiar with build chart, I'm sorry, build, build script, this won't look terribly interesting to you. For those that aren't as, as familiar with it, you'll see that on the, along the top line, it says description is equal, says draw a horizontal line at 100. Well, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a thing there called author equals build charts example. That's purely just so that you can uh, group your, your indicators together just for filing purposes within the build charts uh, file system. The next one is, is important though, target equals price. Target is a special word and attributes the, the terms used within bull charts. It tells where you want the indicator to be displayed. In this instance, I'm saying I want the indicator to be displayed on the price chart. You may remember you can have other charts, other panels, other panes on the screen, uh, typically down below to show volume and things like that. You have the ability at runtime to put your indicator onto those those parts of the screen. The default is target equals price. It says put the indicator you've created and plonk it onto the, the chart itself, onto the price chart. And you'll see those things called attributes are in little square, with inside square brackets that uh, build charts turns into uh, colors in magenta. The, 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 uh, the, the attribute words, description, author, target, and many others is in magenta also. So it picks it up and says, hey, this is one of my words and the stuff in black is the stuff that I've typed. For those that aren't aware, but it's pretty straightforward, semicolon is like a full stop uh, within, uh, within normal text. Semicolon says stop, I've finished my statement, now I can go on to the next statement. So that's the first line explained. The next line is almost totally, I could not get it any simpler than this. It just says 100 semicolon. Bull charts, it's, it's in the name. The whole raison d'etre of uh, bull charts is to display charts. It's to display lines. 
And when you give a number to bull charts, it says, oh, I've got a number. I think I'll draw a line. And that's exactly what it's done here. I've given it the number 100. And it said, I know what to do with that. I'm going to draw a line. And I'm going to draw it at 100. That has happened because there are some defaults, which we'll get into behind the scenes. But that is, I put it to you, just about the simplest um, script, the simplest indicator you could ever make. And in fact, in this instance, the top line isn't even needed because that stuff is, is uh, defaults, so that's redundant. So the very simplest indicator you could ever, ever make would just be a number like 100 all by itself. Not terribly useful, you might say. Let's move on. That's that chart blown up, the, uh, the code blown up so you can see it. Uh, again, for those that don't know, curly brackets, everything between curly brackets is a comment. Bull charts turns it into green so that uh, if you see it in green, you know it's not being uh, not being turned into bull script. That is just a, a comment and you can, you can ignore it. And you shouldn't want it. That's what explains what the code is doing. Okay, so moving on. Uh, the last example was one line, and I think, oh, no, this, I want more lines. So this example draws four lines on the chart, one at 70, one at 80, one at 100, and one at 110. And you can see the, the four numbers there down below. Uh, these four numbers represent the four lines. Uh, I've put them in this order. These three are on this line because there's semicolons here. That separates them, and it's syntactically correct. That means that build charts is happy with what you've written. They could be on, on different lines, all on one line, doesn't matter. But that puts a line at 100, a line at 70, a line at 80, and a line at 110. And there they are on the chart, horizontal lines. And that's the code for those that want to see it in big font. But what about if you wanted to uh, add some uh, color to this? Now we're getting into a little bit more interesting. This chart, demonstrates uh, or draws four lines. Three of them are green. One of them is red. Uh, the red one, in fact, is, is slightly wider than the green ones. It's not totally uh, uh, distinctly different in size, but in fact, they are. And if you look at what we said down here, I want to set up some attributes to, to change the color, color and change the width. So I say here again, within these square magenta brackets, I'm saying the width of this line is going to be three. One is the default, it's thin line. I think they go up to five from memory. And color for this line, I want to be red. Uh, American spelling, C-O-L-O-R, apologies for that. That's what it is. Uh, so this says, draw me a line at 100 and use the current, um, the current active attributes for line drawing. So immediately beforehand, I've said I want the lines to be size three, and I want the color to be red. Then draw me a line at 100, and bingo, it goes there. Now, I decided to change it. I want lines to be a width of two. Color, I want to be green. I'm going to have that 70, 80, and 110, and that draws the three lines on the screen. So we've still got horizontal lines uh, explicitly stated as where they go on the screen, and a little bit of color. Uh, a little bit of flavor coming into the into the menu here. That's the code. So if anybody get if you want to go through the presentation afterwards, the uh, all the code is here, so you can play to your heart's content. All right, let's make this this uh, piece of script a little bit more useful to us. I'm still drawing horizontal uh, lines. Uh, with different thicknesses and colors, but I'm making the first one a little bit more useful to us. And here I'm defining a variable. So think about one of these rows at the bottom of our spreadsheet below the, the stuff that build chart is filled in. And I'm calling, I'm defining a variable called line position. I use underline here as, as a, a space separator, uh, just to make it easy to read. You can type that with or without space. You can type it upper lower case if you want. Uh, I I tend to write my own variable names in lowercase, and I, I by and large use uppercase for the words like target that belong to, to build charts. You don't have to do that. 
that's just a way that I, I, I separate out my, my thoughts. So I've defined a, uh, a new ver a variable called line position, and I give it the value of 100. The colon equals is becomes is, is an assignment. It says, take whatever's on the right-hand side, in this case, 100, and assign it to the horizontal line within that spreadsheet that we've called line position. Why do I want to do that? Because it will give me more flexibility and makes the uh, makes it easier to read. I then say, width is still three, color equals uh, red. And instead of saying 100, I'm saying, put in here the value that's represented by line position, which just happens to be 100. Now we're getting a bit more into the programming, we get more into uh, a useful piece of code. Uh, I've left the other one just the same. You don't have to do it for everything. I've defined this as, as a variable and then referred to the variable. Down here, I'm still using the, uh, the very simple explicit reference to the, to the line, the horizontal line. There's the code. Thank you very much. Now let's do something. Uh, horizontal lines are great, but there's only so much of that you can do. What I've done here is using the line position. I've got rid of the other the 70, 80, and 110 lines. So I'm just using one line now. I've got rid of the, the other lines. And I said, I want to draw a line joining up all the close values. So what I do to do that is I say my line position is close. Still width two, color red. And I want to say draw a line for the value of line position. We have defined, assigned the value of the close value of the bar to a variable called line position. And as we go through, as bull charts go through, goes through from line from bar to bar to bar to bar to bar to bar to bar, it's going to draw a line at the close position. And here you can see it's it's a little bit on top of it. You can see that the red line here is joining the close points of all of those individual bars. That's the code. Now let's move on so we can join all the closed values together. What's better than that? Well, how about putting a, a moving average onto the chart rather than just joining up the closed positions? So expanding on what we've done, uh, I change here my comment just so that I, I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to draw a moving average of the close over 10 periods. And to do that, I define a variable, which I give it a name that makes sense to me in the context that I, I'm using it. And I'm saying the MA10, the moving average 10 of close, I define it to be, I use that colon equals but uh, becomes symbol. It's the moving average, MA in blue. This is a reserved word within bull charts, bull script. So when your thing comes up in blue, that's something that bull charts is looking after. Things in black, you and I are looking after. So this says, define the moving average using the value of the close. I want to be 10 period moving average, and I want to use the simple moving average. The simple moving average is take the last 10 values of the close, add them all up, and divide by 10. Uh, you'll see that this, in fact, this moving average is what's called a function. It has the ability to take parameters, in this case, three parameters, which are then bracketed within round brackets, so that these three parameters belong to the moving average, and it is evaluated, and the value of that for every single bar on this chart, the value of that is assigned to MA10 of choice. Then I say, just draw that as a line. That's a set of numbers. Bull charts, when it give it, you give it a number, it wants to draw that as a line. So it draws it as a line, and you'll see the red line here is the simple moving average of the close price with a, a range of 10. That's the code. Okay, so having a an indicator that tells you what the 10 moving average is is great, but it's a little bit limited. What I'd really like is the ability to change that on the fly so I can say, what's the 10 look like? What's the 20 look like? What's a five look like? 
And to do that, we have to give the indicator the value of the moving average as a parameter. And we do this at runtime. The comment I put in here is, first of all, we select the number of periods as an input parameter. So that's my comment to tell me what I'm just about to do. So somebody reading this code can read that comment and say, OK, I know what this is. We define a, a variable, one of our variables, because it's, it's in black. And I assign to it a value using the input function that says, when I start up this indicator, go and get this value. I'd put a message called number of periods. And I want you to default to 10 if, if the user doesn't give you a value. And it also allows you to set a lower and upper limit to stop out crazy values. So this says when you input the value for number of periods, the default is 10. It has to be greater or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 1,000. Otherwise, you'll get an error message. That those last two parameters are optional. So I could just put a right bracket there and that would disappear. And there would be no checking on the validity of the number of periods. And that's that's OK for, for many parameters. For some parameters, that's not OK. And now I, have, I say here, draw the simple moving average of the close over a variable number of periods. So last time, this is the exact same as the last piece of code. Last time we said I want to draw the moving average of the close using the simple method. And I had in here the number 10, a fixed number of periods. But now that value there is being picked up as part of, as part of this input statement and is then being inserted into the moving average statement here. And then we draw that. The significance of this is that this piece of code now, this indicator, has the ability to give lots of different results depending on the parameter that we want to use. And when you run the indicator, this is chart number seven indicator, C7. It has a 22 in there that says, I've actually chosen to run this indicator with 22 as the parameter value. And that is the 22 symbol moving, oops, Back, simple moving average of that of that CBA chart. If you go back, that's the 10 because we put 10 in there as, a, as an explicit parameter and that's the 22. When you run the indicator uh, and you say insert, if there are any parameters that it wants to take, you put them, it'll come up here and say number of periods which is exactly this message we put here. And it'll invite you to put a value in there. 10 is there because 10 is the default value from the definition of the indicator. If you want to change that, you just go in here and type 22, 120, some, whatever you want, type it in there. And once you've got the indicator um, up and running on the chart like this, these screens obviously wouldn't be there. You'd have closed them down. What you can do is you can click on the name of the indicator, the C7. You can right click on that and re-enter a different parameter. So you can change this parameter on the fly whilst the, this, the indicator is up there and running. So you can dynamically move this to a different parameter setting uh, without having to close the parameter and relaunch it, or close the indicator and relaunch it. Uh, in this example, I've only got one parameter that's that's brought in, which is 10. We'll see as we go forward that we'll have more parameters that we will we will play with. Uh, the other thing to to look at is is quite useful when you you build an indicator. Um, the description of the indicator which normally you'd put up right at the, the top of the indicator. That description field is put into here, into this little text box. And that's a good way to just uh, put a few words in there to say what the indicator is doing. It doesn't have to be war and peace, but just a few words 
that uh, lets people, when they open it, say, oh, yes, this is the right indicator. This is the one I want. That's the code for that. Yes, could I just interrupt you for a minute? Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I missed what you meant about the one and the 1,000 on that code. Sure. Yep. Okay. Um, there are some... Uh, Sometimes there, there's sometimes the, uh, the value you put in there might not make any sense. So, for instance, if you asked for the uh, the simple moving average of the close price with a period length of minus 72, that doesn't make any sense. So, minus numbers, for instance, have no place within the calculation of moving averages. Therefore, you use these. These two parameters here, the second or the the last that's that one to the fourth, the third and fourth parameters to set the boundaries which defines the validity of this parameter. So ten, so the, the moving average, the number of periods for the moving average has to be between one and a thousand. That's just a long between them, but I've said it means though that it can't go below one because trying to ask for the moving average of zero. Or the moving average of minus 27 bars has no sense whatsoever. If you want, you can leave those out, those last two out, and you're just going to get the 10, um, and you can change that. But bear in mind, if you put a crazy parameter in there, you're going to get a crazy result. You're probably, you're probably going to run time error, in fact, if you if you put a negative number into a moving average. That makes sense? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. At this, at this stage here, when you're setting up the, the indicator, if I put in minus 25 at this stage with that those with the code I've got, it'll come back and say invalid argument or something like that. Uh, so it has, to be between, it has to be between one and a thousand. Okay, so that's, we'll put one parameter into the number of moving average periods. Um, of course, there's more than one moving average you, you can define. You can have a simple moving average. You can have an exponential moving average. You can have a weighted moving average. There's a whole heap of them. And build charts allows you to plot uh, any one of those different types of, of moving averages. So maybe you want to have a, this indicator be a bit more flexible. Not Don't just give me the, moving, the simple moving average. I want to get the exponential moving average and the weighted moving average and the try moving average. Um, how do I say which one I want? And you do that by putting in another parameter which we'll call moving average method, MA method, and comes in through an input, input statement here. Naughty me, I should have put this in uppercase because that's what I said was my, uh, the way I normally write code. Uh, but you see, it doesn't matter whether it's upper or case, it's, it's in blue, so bull charts are saying, yep, that's one of my words, I know what you're talking about. And it says here, I want to input a moving average type. I, here's my, description of what I want on that will come up as the when you run the indicator saying enter the moving average method and I give it a default here which is a simple moving average that's the moving average I want by default in this example there are no other parameters like this you'll see why because in this example bull charts will only it internally knows what are valid values for a moving average and it will only allow you to access those. So I say, as before, what's the number of periods I want to, to do this over? What's the moving average method I want to use? And now we're going to use that in our display. Here, I've changed the, the commentary a little bit. I've moved over, over more than one line to show that you can do that. Again, everything from a left curly bracket to a right curly bracket is a comment. Everything in there is freeform text. Uh, and I put in new lines, uh, carriage returns in here, so that it, it spreads over more than one line. The comment says, draw moving average of the close over a variable number of periods using a selected moving average type. I'm putting more variability into what I'm, I'm presenting on the screen. Again, I'm saying the moving average of the close, that's what we've been using for the last few indicators. It's a moving average. I'm using the close value. I'm going to use it over the number of periods 
that I took in through this input statement. And I'm going to use the moving average method that I defined as one of those input parameters. That will default to simple. That will default to 10. And then I say, draw me a line with two, color red, using the moving average of the close. And that's it here. But this, you'll see from the parameters at the top, is no longer a simple moving average because when I set this up, when I defined it, when I invoked this, this indicator, I said I wanted to have it as 10, which is the default, but I want to use the exponential method of calculating a moving average. And so I didn't have an example. Just as in here, um, you were able to pick the 10, go up a bit here. For that second example, there would be here, type of moving average, and there would be a drop down that would say simple exponential. Later on, we'll come to an example of that. That's the code. All right. We have set number of periods as a, a parameter. We've set the moving average method as a parameter. The last thing I want to set here is the open high low close value. Moving averages, often we use the close value to calculate the moving average, but we can use the high value or the open value or the, the low value to calculate the moving average. And we can set that in as a parameter. So I'm saying the open high low close value and we we ask for open high low close to come in as a parameter using this expression function so this says at runtime ask for tell me what type of open high low close i want to use as part of the moving average calculation oops again i've, I've uh, changed the comment here so i'm saying using a selected moving average method with it which is uh, sorry the moving average of the open high low or close a variable number of periods as before and the method is going to be simple exponential or whatever the display for this this moving average is slightly different by default bull charts if you give it a number will draw a line and it's going to draw a it's going to draw a solid line, but there's lots of different lines that you you may want to have. Here I'm saying in this example, I want the line style. Again, it comes up in magenta. It's one of Bull Chart's reserved words. It's an attribute. I wanted the line style to be a dotted line style, still with two, still color red. But I'm using the selected moving average, using the open high low close value that I wanted, using the number of periods that I selected. Oh, sorry, and using the method that I selected. So the top panel here with the dotted line is drawn by this code, and the bottom panel is drawn by the code in the last screen. So here we have the dotted line. You see up here the three parameters now, one, two, three parameters, one, two, three parameters, the 10, which is the default number of periods, the simple, which is the default moving average method, and C for close, the default open high low close. So this chart here is the exactly the same in terms of value as the one below, but it's dotted, but it has the ability to change those to whatever you want. I want to go. So if we said Make that 100, it would give you a moving average of 100. If you had uh, E for exponential, it would be give you an exponential moving average. And if it had an H for a high, it would give, give you an exponential moving average uh, of the high of that particular chart. That's that code. Just a bit of word now about attributes. I've introduced the attribute there called line style we previously have been using attributes color we saw width we saw 
there is a whole host of attributes that describe how things are displayed on the screen. At the very beginning, I, I highlighted target as an attribute. And the default for that is target equals price. That says where you want the chart to be displayed. It could equally, you could say target equals volume, which would put it onto a volume pane if you had one up. It could put it onto a new pane or a new access overlay. All of these things are available. In particular, we'll see later, you can define target as a ribbon. And then instead of, instead of drawing a line on the chart, this will actually draw a ribbon below the chart. And uh, we'll see where that can be useful. Um, line style introduced in the last slide. By default, line style, sorry again, line style is solid. That's just a normal line. Um, in the last chart, I showed how you could make it dotted. It can be dash, which is uh, long dots, long dash step, uh, or step chart is quite useful. It's a, it's a square uh, profile, which often gives a better representation of price activity. Because whereas we think of price going from uh, continuously across the chart, that's not in fact what happens because a stock may close today at 50 and open today at 55, it steps up. That's not a continuous slope between the 50 and 55 because at no stage did it go to 53. So sometimes step charts can be quite useful for giving a, a different view of the world. Uh, Bar charts gives you vertical rectangles going up the chart. So it's a whole heap of line styles you can have. Uh, there are a couple of specific line style types that I'll draw your attention to. One is line style equals marker. When you say line style equals dot solid, that draws a line. But sometimes you don't want to put a line right across the chart. Sometimes you want to stick something on the chart. You want to stick an asterisk on the chart, or you want to stick a, a little airplane figure or a tick or a cross or an up arrow or a down arrow on the chart. For that, you use line style equals marker. And then you say which type of marker you want to make it. Type one is just puts a one on the chart. Type two puts a two on the chart. Type 13 puts an up arrow. Type 14 puts a down arrow. So this combination of line style equals marker and a marker type allows you to stick a label onto the chart somewhere. We'll see how you, how, you, how you put it where you want it. The other special line style is text. And that allows you to take a, a string of text and plunk it somewhere on the chart. And we'll see how to do that. So I think it's a little bit confusing. They use the same nomenclature of line style for all of these. These ones here, I do think of as being lines. Markers, I don't think of as being a line style. Um, text, I don't either, but none the matter. Uh, that's the way they've chosen to do it. Uh, other attributes you can, you can define, things like tooltips, and that will, um, as you roll your cursor across the screen, it'll pop up some textual information to describe what's going on at that point on the chart. And that can be really, really helpful, particularly for ribbons. And then there's lots and lots and lots of other attributes you can have, font, font style sign, text align, telling you a lot of these ones obviously are about uh, how to draw words on the chart, what size you want the, the characters on the chart. Other ones we saw earlier on, uh, you can use uh, the author descriptor, which tells you who wrote the, uh, the indicator, but is more useful in terms of grouping the indicators together in the same directory so you can find them easily. Uh, description we saw, tells you what the indicator is doing and puts that onto the, the initiation menu when you when you uh, invoke the indicator. Okay, so we've got to the stage now where we can draw a single line on the chart and we can add parameters to that single line that tell us how we want that uh, that line to be displayed. So what about doing two of them? Uh, it's a logical, uh, uh, a logical thing to want to do. And that's where I said we're, we're going to move towards creating a golden cross. Two moving averages of the crossover, often called a golden cross, with uh, particular parameter values that 
uh, are magic to some people and, and less magic to others. So this first bit of text here, all this, this first block, draws moving average one. I've got a typo, my apologies. And the second one should say draw moving average two. But we've taken the, the code, I've changed some of the names to be number of periods one, moving average method one, open high low close value one. I've redefined them as, or not redefined, I've defined new variables, very similar. Number of periods two, moving average method two, which I'll see value two. And I have input the values as parameters to those six variables. And you'll see I've made this back into uppercase for consistency. This statement here is exactly what we had uh, pretty much in the last example. Uh, the difference is that I've made the line solid in this case, and I've made it green. And then the second line is the dotted line we had in the last example with two, color red. But using different methods, different number of periods, and different open, high, low, close values. If you look at the chart behind here, you'll see there's a green line, which is this guy here, moving average one, and there's a red dotted line, which is moving average two. If you look at the parameters that were set up when this was initiated, the first three refer to these three values, the second three to these three values. So MA1 is a 10 moving average of a simple EM of a simple moving average based on the close and the second three say still a simple average still a close but it's going to be a 20 number of periods so what you have here is very simply uh, an SMA 10 versus an SMA 20 and that is I guess as simple a goal across, you get two moving averages that cross over uh, from a, a charting point of view. You know, the, the crossover points are important to us. The angle of the slope might be important to us, but we're getting now into something that is a, a, an indicator that might be useful to us. Again, you'll see I've, I've changed the description slightly now to say draw two moving averages, boom, boom, boom. Uh, and I just replicated this code changed the variable name so they don't repeat each other. You can't have two variables with the same name. Ain't gonna work. And that's the uh, the code for there. And apologies, my, co my comment here should say moving average two. I thought I'd fixed everything there, Robert. There you go. Um, this is the exact same code. And all I've done here is I've tidied the code up a bit. Um, just for readability, structure, and, and tidiness. Um, I've taken all of the, the input uh, code and put it together. So I, the first thing I do in this is get all the parameters, suck them in. Then I calculate the fast moving averages. I've, I've called it fast moving average and slow moving average. You'll see that I've squeezed this box up and they the code just rolls onto the next line. So now it hasn't changed the uh, what the, the code will do. It's just, uh, it formats it for me this way as I squeeze it onto the left-hand side of the screen. So we get in the parameters, we calculate the two moving averages, and then we draw the two moving average lines. So the first one, solid line, with two, color green is the fast one, and the dotted one, with two, color red is the slow one. So there we have the red moving average, is slow, it's moving less aggressively. The green moving average is the quick moving average, the fast moving average, and it's more jerky, more pointed, and these points of crossover may or may not be of interest to us. Any questions for anybody on that? Does that make sense? Are we still, uh, still with it? I'll take it no news is good news. Des, that's a good place to pause for a moment and see if anyone okay. wants any clarification. Sometimes it takes a minute for, for people to press the button, um, but it's looking like there aren't any questions. There's none outstanding Excellent. in the chat box. 
maybe you should continue. Thanks, Des. I shall do so. That's the code for that, cleaned up uh, as I try and do. Here is the what that would look like uh, when you invoke this indicator. So you've put a chart up on the screen, you've uh, loaded this indicator, and the first thing it does is, uh -uh, I need to have some parameters. And it pops up those six values, one, two, three, four, five, six, in that order, and puts those messages out. So there are the six values, two the, to give you the fast and slow periods, two to give you the fast and slow methods, and two to give you the open, high, low, close. You'll see that these ones here are drop down boxes that bull charts will, if when you click on that, it will give you a drop down box of five or 10 different types of moving average methods. You click the one you want. The same for the open, high, low, close, it'll only give you four. Open, high, low, close, you pick whichever one you want, and that will display the, the chart as appropriate. And you'll see here again within the the uh, the border of the chart uh, where the indicator uh, has after it's been loaded you'll see the six parameters and the six parameter values are up there and if anybody's in that 1017927 I suspect is the will be one of these uh, uh, moving average probably that one the green moving average value. So set your parameters up and hit finish, and that'll display the chart. Uh, if you want to get back to this, right click the name of the indicator on the, on the border, top border, and this panel will come back up again, and you can change them to your heart's content. Right, add a bit of color between the lines. What can I say? I've just said it. Uh, if you look at, that, yeah, understand that, know what it means. Some people find that a bit easier to look at. So what we've done here is all of this is just what we had before. And then this little bit down the bottom says, I want to fill in lines with color, between the lines with color. The line style, again, one of these attributes is now fill. We've had solid, we've had dotted, but lots of other ones. One of the line style types is fill. And that says fill between the lines. And then you describe what color you want and where you want it between the fast and the slow MI, slow MA. And depending on the order you put these in, you'll either get green for here and red for there, or red for there and green for here. So that's a very, very simple way to add a bit of color to your chart that for many people makes that easier to read. Uh, not necessary, it's there. And I, I think at your your um, meeting last month, Robert was saying somebody was showing that the uh, MACD indicator is provided within bull charts. It has that facility. There's a fill function within MACD, which is by default is turned off, but you can turn it on if you want to get this this sort of uh, this sort of look. Um, makes it very very easy, particularly when you get this sort of area. It makes it much easier to see where the crossovers are when you've got full body. Uh, fillers like that. That's the code. Okay, I mentioned an attribute type uh, called marker. And a marker, as I said, was just allows you to stick a post-it note onto the screen or put a thumbprint on the screen. It allows you to put a mark onto the screen. Uh, not brain surgery that. The, the sensible markers you'd want to put onto this screen would be to highlight uh, whenever the two moving averages cross over, when they cross up, uh, you'd want it to be, go, it's going into the green shaded area. So it's going in here, we're saying I want an up arrow that's green uh, and a down arrow that's red. To do that, it's this, that's the, the code we've had before, just going off the top of the screen. And then this is the piece of code that we're adding to make these little up and down arrows, the markers. So first of all, I define what is a cross up. Uh, we use this function called cross. 
from uh, from within bull charts, bull script, and it takes two parameters, which are lines, and it says when the fast moving average, that's the the green line, when it crosses up over the slow moving average, the red line, cross up becomes true. So we've defined a variable here called cross up. We're going to use that variable as a, in computer terms, a Boolean value, a value that holds true or false, one or zero. And we're saying we get a cross up whenever, according to the function called cross within bull charts, when the fast moving average crosses up over the slow moving average, I'm saying, yep, that cross up value is true. And if you think about it on our spreadsheet, at this bar on the spreadsheet, that cross up value would have a one put into it to say true. The bar after it would have a zero in it. And you may say, oh, that, that's still true. It is still true, but it's not the bar that it actually crossed over. All we want to know is, is this the bar where it actually crossed to go the green from above below the red to above the red? And that says that cross up is true only at that point and at that point and at that point, but not at that point, for instance. Cross down is the other, the other side, the other way. Cross down says when the, the slow moving average and that's the uh, red one, crosses up through the fast one, then we so here, the slow moving average, the red, is crossing up over the green. That's what I want to say, we've got a cross down. So I've defined two variables, Boolean variables, value one or zero, that tell me when it cross, these two lines cross up or when they cross down. And then the next two statements, stick the labels on so i'm saying i want to create a marker the line style is marker put a semicolon in to stop that i want this marker to be type 13 why type 13 because i happen to know that type 13 is an up arrow but if you hit help and go into uh, into the bull charts help it'll tell you what those 29 uh, different marker types are so i just happen to know from experience type 13 is an up arrow Type 14 is a down arrow. A cross up is a good situation, so I'll give it a green color. A cross down is a bad situation, so I'll give it a, uh, a red color. Uh, to make things line up nicely, I've just put a couple of spaces in here, so these line up nicely. Extra spaces are okay if it keeps it tidy, neat and tidy. I've chosen to do that here. Um, and here you see, and width is one, that's the, uh, the size of the arrow. You're going to width was two or three or four the arrow would be bigger obviously so what that does is it, it says it looks at the two moving averages it puts a green arrow at the cross up and a red arrow at the cross down unfortunately it actually puts the arrow so that it points towards the bar where it happened it doesn't actually put it on the on the chart at where the the arrows the the lines have crossed so that's a little bit uh, bit of a pain but a design feature there you go that's the code that does all of that so that is the on the previous one i was just highlighting this bit of code down here but you'll see that that is the total code uh with the two moving averages drawn the six parameters and robert is your father's brother bob's your uncle Right. Um, if you look at that chart, that's that's pretty easy to understand. Um, and I think a lot of us have gone down the path of when it comes to charting, the more the merrier. And it is easy to get your your, your chart into a situation where it's very very busy, and some simplification might be worthwhile. And those of you that know me would know that I'm a very keen uh, proponent of using ribbons to simplify the chart. So take the information that's being displayed on the chart, pull it down onto a ribbon so that you can keep the chart clean. So it doesn't become cluttered, 
so it becomes easy to read. And it's of particular use when you have multiple ribbons, because then you can see how one ribbon interacts with another ribbon in terms of reinforcing uh, their values or in terms of disagreement in values. So if we look at the code here that draws this ribbon, so the, um, the green and the red lines are drawn by the, the C14 chart 14, as it's the one we've just been looking at. Uh, so that's no different. So take that as a given it's been displayed. I'm going to use the same uh, code, and I'm going to turn that same code into a ribbon. So you'll see that the code looks very similar, but is not identical to the previous indicator. Um, the first thing you'll notice is I've got up here target equals ribbon not target equals price, target equals ribbon. And that fundamentally says this indicator is producing a ribbon. It's not producing uh, anything on the chart as such. I still take the, the same values as input, six values, accept them. I still calculate the fast and slow moving averages as before. These are variable depending on these, these parameters. And I still calculate the whether we're crossing up or crossing down. That's the the places where these arrows are, are drawn here. Nope. Now what I say is, I want to decide whether this ribbon at any point of time is green or red. And I write this little statement. It's quite simple, but it's very powerful. So I'm saying, I've got a green ribbon if we've got a cross up. So there's a cross up here, and that makes sense. It's crossed up. I want to turn to green. So I say green ribbon is true. If I got a cross down, so a cross down is, is here, a cross down, I'm saying green ribbon is false because it's a red ribbon. And that's great. So I know that at each of these points where they cross over, I am able to select the color that's appropriate for that point in time. But what about the bits in between? Well, the bits in between say, just leave it as it is. And that's where this, this special little variable um, called previous is used. And that says, if it's a cross up, green ribbon is true. If it's a cross down, green ribbon is false. And if it's neither up or down, just leave it as the previous value of green ribbon. So that just says, leave it as it is. It's a bit like the bull charts function history, where you could say, uh, if it's not up, if it hasn't crossed up or it hasn't crossed down, just take the value of the history of the green ribbon going back one bar. So that's a little bit of, of code to define when we've got a green ribbon. Now, we display that green ribbon just here. We know the target is ribbon. I'm going to say the ribbon is green. I'm going to give it a tool tip called going up. And the width is going to be one. You can change the width of the ribbon. Width is one is the normal you'd use for this sort of size. And if green ribbon is true, display a green color and the tool tip going up. And if it's not tr if it's not a green ribbon, it's got to be a red ribbon. So default to, uh, to true and the color will be red. So that little piece of, oh, go back. That little piece of code is responsible for drawing this ribbon, and you'll see that it does line up and match with the uh, the ribbons, the uh, the green and red areas on the chart. That's the code. And just to tell you where you can go, uh, can we, yeah. Um, You've now got a chart with crossing lines, a, a golden cross moving average. You've got arrows saying where you uh, where you crossed up and where you crossed down. Um, you might want to say, oh, let's use this as a, as a trading system. And you can do the calculation. If I entered here and I exit here, what is the, so again here, exit, entering here, exiting here, what is the return on that trade? 
well, pretty awful in this particular instance, minus 26%. But this one here, if I got in here, this trade, this bar, and I get out of the, the most recent bar, the, the, the close, the current close, it'd be up 20.8%. And a little bit of commentary there saying that's the profit or loss percent from five trades uh, for the CBA chart. CBA is in the FXJ index, the financials. Uh, it says it's five trades because it's going one, two, three, and two of them are off the screen. Uh, Des, well, that's the yep. Could, I, could you go back to um, the the code for the ribbon? I'm just a little confused with the last line there. That one? Yeah. So where you sort of have the second last line, you sort of say to me that's saying if true, draw the green ribbon. Correct. The second line. Why does it the last the last statement there says true? Right. Because, in fact, and I thank you for 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 bringing that uh, to to notice. Um, when you you draw ribbons, think about it again. Back into that big spreadsheet, um, you are um, you're only dealing at any one time with a single bar on the ribbon, and you're working or the bull chart is working its way through drawing the ribbon. Once you say this is the color for the ribbon. It draws that color and then finishes. So what we say here is that uh, when we when we actually get down to drawing a piece of green, that last piece of code is ignored. Does that make sense? Uh, no, not. I guess. <laughs> still not because I, I, okay, I, I can do this slightly that, differently. I, I could define red ribbon is not green ribbon. Does that makes sense? Yeah. Red ribbon is not green ribbon. I could then say green, color green, green ribbon, color red, red ribbon. All right, okay. Okay. So I, I just this is just the default me, condition. Just what it threw me is the last word that says true true yeah i'm using that as the catch-all if if we haven't had a green ribbon we must have had a red ribbon so let's call that as true so sometimes what i do do in fact it's a, trying to keep it simple but i've obviously made it arguably too simple a, a better way or a more normal way i would do this i would define green ribbon i would define red ribbon as not green ribbon and then i'd say yeah. green for green ribbon red for a red ribbon and then i would have another line here that would say uh, color yellow tooltip equals error and here I, then i would put the true and that would be the catch-all if it's not green and if it's not red it, it'll, it'll hit the error condition now it's it's trivial for you doing greens and reds but if you've got a very complex ribbon situation you may want to trap this case where none of the ribbon conditions were true and you may want to trap that as an error message gotcha all right Makes Makes sense? Sense. yep Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let that sink in come back to me send me an email um i've tried to keep it simple but sometimes it's wasn't the right way yeah, that makes sense man okay so things you might want to do going f further on you, you, you we've now got a uh a, a, a golden cross moving average uh, indicator. What can I do with that? As an example, you can start calculating whether it was a profitable or a lost trade if you use those crossovers as entry exits. And the code to do that, so up to here, this is the uh, uh, the code that uh, checked for the cross up and down, uh, gave me the, uh, the market type 13 and 14, two hours. So up to here, We've seen all this stuff. This is putting the red arrows on the chart. What I've done in here, don't you worry too much about what this is. This is calculating the profit and loss. So that piece of code is calculating that number and that number. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise to you can, but you can see things like 
the price movement is the close value minus the value when we had the last cross up. So that tells you how you're calculating, looking back in time to uh, define what the difference in, in price is. Uh, did we make a loss? A loss? Did we make a profit? All those things. Here's the important bit though from this. This is how you display text. So this stuff here, these numbers, oh, these numbers here, and this piece of text along here. So this line here, PRL percent from number of trades, trades, and then security sector index and, and security sector. That, Oh, wrong way. That outputs that piece of information there in blue. Color equals blue. In fact, blue is the default color if you don't specify it. So that puts that bit of uh, bit of text onto the screen. Um, here, these two lines here put on the the numbers on the screen. Green if we made a profit. Red if we made a loss. And uh, then that's, that's the, I calculate up here the profit of this trade and I round it down to one, one decimal point for the profit, add on a percentage sign and put that onto the screen. As is normal, whenever you start doing more complex things, you'll see things like this in green. These are debugging statements I put in as I was writing this little bit of code just to check what was happening. Uh, and then you, I comment them out and that's very common when you, you, uh, you write bits of code. It could be when you want to tidy up finally that the code you think is totally complete, you can delete all that all that commentary, the debug commentary, because it's no longer needed. I normally leave it in because when I come back to the uh, to the piece of code, I might I want to have a look at it and change something. So that is how you can put text and numbers and information onto a chart. And so that code did this. You can go more, this is, here's an example of using the golden cross to run a system, which will take these profit and loss points, calculate an annualized profit, uh, calculate what the, the maximum drawdown was, what the win rate, win rate was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on this, I've put the commentary on, this is a golden cross strategy 50 on 200. It's picked the 50 and 200 up from the the parameters up here so that's the sort of thing you can start to do once you have grasped that level of competence and able to put a few things onto the chart you are then able to get much more complex uh, indicators and this one is one that i commonly have as, as a template i use to calculate uh, whether a trading strategy would be profitable or not and in this case uh, for that period of time on CBA, Golden Cross of, of uh, 50 to 200, that nah, was not profitable, but there you go. Uh, does where uh, in the code does it tell you where to put the num where to put the numbers? Excellent, or does it very good. No, 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 no. It's um, yeah, gets more complex, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I could see my numbers if I did this going everywhere. So, so yeah, I'm yeah. Good question. <laughs> so, when we have um, line style equals text, okay, and as I said, once you set a, a line style type, it stays like that until you change it to something else. So up here, I've defined line style equal text, and therefore that means everything that I present is using that that text format. When you, you present something in text, you're right, you have to say where to put it. And there are two things I've got on here that tell me where to put it. One is print level. See here, everyone has got print level. And you see some of my debugging statements, I've got print level times 0 0.9, 0 0.8. That allows me, print level is a variable that I have defined here as the last value of the close. Print level is there, that value there. It's 100.85, that is the print level. I then, within the code, 
wrong way. I define my print level as the last value of the close times 0.25. So, oh, oh, I keep going the wrong way. If that's the last value of the close, which is at 100 and whatever, and I want, I've said my print level is that times 0.25, it says my print level is at 25. Boom. So I define my print level, the vertical position on the screen as a percentage of some fixed point and the fixed point i would often use would be the final close value so i've said take the final close value come down to 25 percent of it and that's where you draw draw this stuff on that print level that makes sense Yep. So that tells you vertically on the page where you're putting it, but with, it's more complex than that. You asked for it. Um, <laughs> go back to remember we were talking about this, this is just a big spreadsheet with lots of bars on it, every bar. If I said, as I did early on, I said, for every bar, draw a line through the close, and it went draw a line, draw, or draw a bit of a line, draw a bit of a line, draw a bit of a line. It put something across every bar of this chart and if i said print a value of i don't know 7.2 if i just say print 7.2 it's going to print 7.2 as text on every bar of the chart and that's not what i want i don't want to see p or l percentage from five trades here 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 all the way across i just want to see it once and the way you say you're, you want it just once, uh, do, 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 do. I bet you haven't put it on this. Uh, I, apologies, it's not on this on this segment of, of code. It's in here. Last bar. I define last bar to be when the bar number equals the last value of the bar number. So I define when the last bar occurs. The last bar is just the same on this one. The last bar is here. And this says only print these things out when you're on the last bar. And when you do print them, as per your example or this example, print them at 0.25 of the, the close. So this stuff is only printed out, sorry, this stuff here is only printed out on the last bar. This stuff is only printed out whenever we have a cross. Does that just confuse the subject, Leonie? No, it, it hasn't, it actually made it clearer, but um, whether I can do it or not is another matter. But... <laughs> Come back well, to me, I can help out. You've the, it to the, me. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the easy one to think about is these ones here, where they only get printed if I made, made a profit or a loss. So those are not being printed all the way across. It's only when there's a profit or when there's a profit or a loss or a profit. That's the only time I print them out. So they, by nature, are spaced out because I'm not saying do them uh, all the way across. For these labels here on the right hand side, you've got to you've got to say, I only want you to do it at the very once it's all done, at the very end of yeah. the chart. So that's why you have that um last bar. Last bar. Last bar. Yeah. Wait, last bar. Okay. Thanks, Des. All right. Sorry. <laughs> the devil's in the detail and there's a lot of detail. Uh, but you can see how in this one, as I said, the, the, the debugging statements that I put in, uh, I, I put the print level at a diff a different point so I can move them up and down so that here, I've done that here. So each of these lines, that, that hold of held probably is at, is at the close value. That CBA weekly is probably at close times 1.1. That's probably you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.25, 0 0.2. So that's how you move them up and down the screen. Okay. Um, Homework, if you want to do it, you looked at the MACD last last month, I'm told. 
the, the crossover we've just done is is very much similar to a, the a MACD crossover. And here's a MACD. Everything you see in here, this is a MACD. This is not a moving average of uh, uh, five and 12 or, or five, 50 and 200. This is the MACD. We've colored it in the, the green and the red. We've got little up arrows. Uh, so the little arrows there, the up arrows are cross up, the red arrows are cross down. The big blue up arrow is a cross up below zero, which if you're playing with MACDs is often a uh, uh, a buy signal. It's, it's, a, it's a, a sign of strength. And here below that, what I've got is that exact, all this stuff here represented as a ribbon. So you see, there's the green ribbon, green ribbon, there's the pink ribbon, pink ribbon. There's the blue arrow saying that's a significant point. So you can look at the ribbon and say, oh, what's happening here? What's happening here? What's happening here? And I would normally just have the ribbon up. I would not show this pane because uh, I think that's the clearest way to represent that information. And it's the same information that's being represented. So that's what you could maybe think of doing. Summary, I'm pretty much done. Um, I hope we can agree that indicators are not as hard as you thought they might be. Uh, if you start simple, work your way up, I think you, you can get there and you know people will help you. I certainly will help you. Anybody can drop me an email and I'll, I'll help you debug your, your indicator if you want. Uh, as part of this presentation, I've started simple and worked up to more and more complex things. And at every stage in the presentation, I've given you the code that's currently being used to display what's there. So you can tinker with a piece of code and oh, see what happened on the screen. A good way as you, as you go forward is to take some of the indicators that are within bull charts, and there's hundreds of the damn things, take an indicator, modify it, change it, see what happens. You're not going to get into trouble. Just play with them. Um, I would encourage you to keep, try and keep it simple as much as possible. I've got some indicators that are anything but simple, uh, but it's, it's taken me a long time to get there. I recommend using ribbons. I think they simplify the view of the world. And if you, when you have multiple ribbons, uh, it's much easier to look at the multiple indicators. And multiple ribbons do give you that ability, if you like, in your eyes to slide them one across each other and see where they're correlating and where they're not. Uh, all this code, uh, I shall just tidy up and give to Robert and the presentation. It'll be on the build chart site. Robert will uh, edit my dulcet tones on this recording and put that up there, I'm sure. Uh, and I can't overemphasize, if you, anybody's got a problem, just give me a call or, or drop me a line on, on, on that email. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to try and help you out. And I am done. Any questions? Yes, very good. Thank you. There is one question in the chat box. Vinny yep. has said, amazing. Des, how did you learn all this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, my background is that I'm originally a mathematician. And then way back there, I said in the early 70s, 1971, when I was at university, uh, computers were sort of coming out and I, I moved from being a mathematician to being a, a computer mathematician, if you like. Uh, so very early on on the piece, I've been, I've been programming since I was 16. The first program I wrote was at 16 at school. And uh, I've been programming in many, many languages over the years. So I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably adept at, at picking up languages. But having said that, any language, when you dig into it, takes months and months and months of effort. So how did I learn it? A very good experience in in languages and a, uh, a, a enjoyment. I, I get a lot of joy out of doing this. It's the, the the systematic analysis of a problem and then finding a way to represent that. I, I find that quite quite a lot of fun. Uh, it keeps my uh, keeps me out of my wife's hair as well. Um, so if you want to do any of this, it's not impossible. It helps if you have a, a mathematical or a, a, an engineering background. It helps if you're logical. If you're not logical, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, as I said to, to Robert the other week, that if, I'm happy to help people out. If you can describe what it is you want to do, and you can describe it succinctly and clearly without um, 
contradiction, then we can pro program it up, it up. Some people have come to me and said, Des, can you write me a, a piece of bull script that will just give me the, the top 10 strongest stocks? And I go, stop, define strongest stock. Oh, you know the one's going up quickest? Define going up quickest. You know, And then what universe of stocks do you want to do? All that stuff. But once you get your mind around a clear definition of what it is you want to do, we can do it within within programming. And uh, the bells and whistles, you don't have to worry about the bells and whistles. That's uh, I do that. I like to have my charts clean and neat and tidy and, and that stuff because I'm a bit of a tidy uh, person. But that's where I learned it all. Des, thanks for that. You've instilled a lot of confidence in us and convinced us that we need to spend many months or years working on this before we get <laughs> to a reasonable standard. Uh, yeah, it's just another holy grail you can chase. Rob, well, I can get, I make I, a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. I just want to reiterate what uh, Des just said about playing with it. It's it's very easy to get one of the bull charts um, uh, or indicators already there. Just click on formula and cut and paste it into a new one and modify it. And that way you can have a play and you can see just how Des set it out where he defined the variables first, then he worked on them. It's all set out in bull charts in the formulas. And same if you get a formula from some other site, copy and paste it and then just work it into the bull charts as Des has had. But that's the easiest, cut and paste it into a new one and play with it until you get it to do what it does. Bull charts will tell you if it's if you've done something wrong. Um, and yeah, have a, have a play with what's already there and modify what you want to do. If you've got an indicator in bull charts that um, e.g. MACD or something else, turn it into a ribbon. Des has got the code for you. You can just cut and paste and modify it for, you, for your indicator. So yeah, that's that's the best tip. Um, if you're not confident programming, to use use someone that is and use their ideas, cut and paste it and play with it. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. I mean, and that, that's how I uh, I learned it. I mean, I I read the manual, just skip through the manual to get an idea of what's there, and then just uh, start playing. Yeah, well, I I pretty much done the same guys. I've um, uh, first I think learned some MetaStop basic and. Uh, the kind of the, the blue chart is interchangeable with meta stock. So yep. I then uh, I've used codes already in blue chart to, you know, uh, as a basis to create a new code. But yeah, at best though, I'm I'm a hacker, and that that's being kind. Um, yeah, what I'm what I've seen there is it's, um, yeah, it's pretty pretty significant step up. <laughs> so I think you've um, inspired me. Very good, Des, Paul, Vinny, thank you for the input there. And I'd like to add uh, I have that... another question. Yeah, go Sorry, on, I have Annie. another question. Yeah, go on. Um, you know how when you do your own scans, you attribute it to yourself so you can find them? Yeah. Uh, what happens with these indicators? I gather they go into custom indicators, but how can you identify them as you put a subfolder in there or...? That that's what the author thing is all about. Under uh, author, it's... you can put a name in there, which could be your name, which is what most people do, and, and Robert's just showing it up here. Uh, so you see, author equals uh, Guppy Darrell, and when you yeah. go into the indicators, you'll see them grouped by by that name. And here we go. Uh, so you find them that way. So if you put find yourself in there, you'll be there. Yep. Okay. You'll be there. But for this example, I put them into bull charts examples. So those uh, co those uh, indicators were all grouped together for easy, just for easy to find. But, yep. but a good example there, Robert, showing the, the copy indicators okay. all grouped together. Right. Thanks very much. Brilliant presentation, Des. Thank you. Thank you. And I can add something else that might help some of you too, and that is um, this here is the bull script help. So you get that from help, bull script help. Don't go to bull charts help, go to bull script help. And when you pull this up, you can type in something like markers and here you get all of those markers. One of the things Des showed us in the presentation was the types. And he said type 13 was an up arrow. There it is there. 
So by type using type 13 or the words type 8 or, or type 25, these are the little icons that you can have and insert into the chart. It's the same as going over to here and choosing one of these icons from the icon palette. That's the same thing, same place. So you can get markers. And the other thing you can do with this Bullscript help is if you're looking at some existing code and you're wondering about things like cross, Des showed us cross, you can type in cross and hit enter. And here the Bullscript help tells you what the cross function is and how it works. Uh, another one he showed that might have been a bit elusive was value when, as an example. Value when, the number of times counted back, blah, blah, blah. So all of these bull charts functions, reserved words, are here in the bull script help. And you can either look through the index for them or use the search to, to search for them. So that's a very useful way to try to better understand the existing scripts that you might be looking at. And I could say to that, Robert, is that in fact that that system is pretty good. It's pretty complete. It's not it doesn't have everything in it, uh, but if you want to find something, you almost certainly will find it in that uh, that book script help. It's pretty good. Very good. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Uh, I won't play the video now. We can do that another time. You can do that. All right. We'll wrap it up. I'll turn Thank off you. recording. Thanks, everyone, for your interest and participating. And